Well, good morning and welcome to our Sunday School class on the Revelation. As you can see, we're in Revelation chapter 2, so we have made headway. <laughs> we are almost 5% of the way through the book of Revelation. If there's 22 chapters and we've done one, that's almost 5%. And as you can tell, the uh, subject of today's uh, lesson is uh, the specific message that Jesus had for the church that was at Ephesus. It was an Orthodox church, very good with doctrine and testing unbeliever, uh, false teachers, but they had become an unloving church, and we'll see all that unfold uh, as we look at the passage. Let's, let's pray. Lord, we're grateful to you for your word. We're grateful that we have this vision of you uh, in your exalted condition as you are today ministering to your church, disciplining and caring for and taking care of and being in authority over your church. We bless you that this is a reality and uh, we bless you that we have an audience in heaven, that we are not just uh, what we seem to be uh, as being evaluated through the world's eyes, uh, but uh, through your eyes, uh, we are precious and important, and we bless you because of that. And we say it in your name, Lord Jesus, amen. Now, before we focus on the letter that the Lord dictated to John for the church in Ephesus, we, uh, I want us to consider some general observations uh, about this set of seven letters that we're going to look at uh, that were dictated to each of the seven churches in Asia that the Lord Jesus specified. Now these letters, I want you to remember and keep in mind, were written to real people. They were real churches, real cities. They had real strengths, real weaknesses. And Jesus, through John, chose seven churches out of the about 30 churches that were in this region in Asia Minor. There were also churches at Colossae and Troas and Miletus, Pisidian, Antioch, Nicaea, Iconium, and Lystra. Um, but these seven were probably chosen because they reflected the spectrum of church characteristics that range from good churches to bad churches in those historical churches. Remember, these are historical churches. They had individual strengths and weaknesses, and they received specific warnings and instructions. So they were a group. They were like ours. They were a group of Christians gathering together in this city, which we'll look at in just a moment. So they were specific churches, but they, were, they, but they also represent perennial churches, the ongoing, long-term church, in that their strengths and their weaknesses um, have existed and continue to exist commonly in the church throughout the entire church age. So it's been roughly 2,200 years, so to speak, a little short of that. These warnings and the instructions uh, that are given by Jesus are needed everywhere throughout the world and throughout the church age. And we can be certain that these letters are not just for those seven churches, but they're for, for the broader church throughout the church age because every one of those letters um, has this line where Jesus said, he who has an ear, she who has an ear, let her hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, I see at least four possible applications of each of the messages that Jesus uh, dictates to John. Uh, first, what he said applies to the historical church, the church that he was evaluating. 
uh, and instructing. Jesus was Lord of his church in every location that it existed at the time and is Lord of the church that exists worldwide at any location throughout any time. So it was what he said applied to those literal historical churches. It also applies to the entire church age, the church throughout the church age, and we will recognize that their problems are our problems and that their strengths are our strengths and that the prescriptions that Jesus gives and the encouragement that he gives are what we need specifically. Also, there is application for each of these things that are said to every individual, to each of us. Because it says, he who has an ear. This is an individual statement. And Jesus speaks saying, to him who overcomes. That's a specific individual statement. Now, some see these letters as having a prophetic anticipation of how the church would develop all the way through the church age. That's not stated in the text. Uh, there's no basis for seeing these letters as being prophetic. Perhaps in hindsight, we can look and say, oh, my goodness, the church on earth had that characteristic in that time. And then those various characteristics seem to show up. But uh, at best, this would be a secondary application. It, it doesn't seem to be what the Lord Jesus intended, um, at least in my opinion. It's secondary at best. Now, I want to highlight some of the common features of all of the letters. They have a common for format, and they have some common content. And when you look at all the letters and compare them side by side, you'll uh, see that there are uh, lots of similarities. First of all, uh, each letter is addressed to the angel or the messenger of a specific church in a specific city. And each of the first five letters uh, depicts the Lord Jesus with characteristics that John saw in his vision of the Lord in chapter 1, verses 9 to uh, 20. Those characteristics that are mentioned there, his glowing uh, head white like wool, his eyes like fire, feet like bronze, and so on and so forth, sword coming out of his mouth, those are picked up by Jesus as he dictates the letter to the various churches. And you'll see uh, how that occurs in the letter to Ephesus. Each letter commends that which is good in each church, if there's anything that is good. And specifically, Laodicea, Jesus had nothing good to say. He observed nothing good about that church. And then each identifies the evil that is present, if there's any present. And a couple churches, specifically... Philadelphia and Smyrna. There, there's nothing negative. He has nothing negative to say about those churches. Each letter commands the necessary action in light of their need, and each has this exhortation. He who has an ear, let him hear. And each makes a promise to him who overcomes. Our format that we will take today um, and for the next, well, today plus four more weeks, we'll get through all seven churches. Uh, we'll use this format. And we'll, we'll read the letter. Uh, we'll look at what it says about the Lord, what it says about the church. We'll take some time to understand the city and the historical context of that where the church was existing. Um, 
we'll cover the good, we'll cover the evil, the required action, the exhortation, and the promise. All right, let's look at the letter to Ephesus and uh, see what the Lord Jesus has to say to this orthodox but unloving church. And you'll see uh, why I picked that as a title for the church at Ephesus. I'm reading from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. And Jesus told John to write this, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false and you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary but I have this against you you have left your first love Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The Lord Jesus describes himself as the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and as the one uh, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, which we know according to chapter 1, verse 20, those are the churches. He holds the seven stars. Ephesus had had some star teachers, if you want to call them that. Paul, Timothy, John. Some, some, some really high, Apostle John. John was there after Paul and Timothy left, and he was there. It was probably from Ephesus that he was exiled when Domitian came in in 90 AD and made a formal policy of persecuting, of, of made, made the church illegal. And John was taken from Ephesus, most likely, brought across the bay over to the island of Patmos. He had been uh, in Ephesus for many years but it's Jesus who controls the church even with star teachers and preachers and leaders it's Jesus who holds the stars in his hand he is the one who controls the church and this word that it says he holds the the stars in his hand that that indicates to hold something authoritatively to exhibit control We need to understand, beloved, that the church is under the divine protection and control of Jesus Christ. Is, I mean, isn't that fantastic? Regardless of how good the leaders are or how bad, Jesus is the one who controls the church. He's in control of the church. He oversees the overseers. And the one question that I might raise at this juncture is, can you trust him? Can you trust him with the leadership of his church? He holds the seven stars. And there's obviously, I, I spoke about this a few weeks ago, there's some debate about what the stars refer to. I've settled on that the stars that are held in Jesus' right hand are uh, leaders in the local churches. But other people who I trust and who have uh, godly lives, they have, a different, they have a different conclusion. They think it's angels, literally uh, angel. And there's a lot of argument for that because every other time in the book, the word that angelos is translated as an angel. It's a heavenly being. 
Sometimes it's a demonic being, but okay, so there, there's discussion, and it's good, legitimate discussion. I just want you to understand that the exact meaning, um, it's okay to have different opinions about that. But what's still exhibited either way is that Jesus has control of his church. He's under the divine protection and care of Jesus Christ. He walks among the lampstands. He is the sovereign ruler of the church. He has, stored, he has the authority to inspect and address the churches. He has the authority to inspect and address this church. Ephesians 5.23 says Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. So the Lord, as he addresses Ephesus, describes himself in terms that reflect his sovereign control of the church and his authority over the church. Then we look at the church itself. This church, as I had said earlier, had some very powerful leadership through the years. Uh, initially, there was Aquila and Priscilla, which we read about in Acts. Then there was Apollos, who was an Old Testament believer. But then after he had sat under the tutelage of Aquila and Priscilla, he uh, understood what the, the new uh, truth about the new covenant, the Messiah had come, and he grasped all that, and he became a leader in that church. As I said, Paul ministered there. He was there for three years. That's a long conference. I mean, that's a great time for a person to instill into a group of people a wide range of truth. And remember that Paul had actually been with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus met him on the road, said, you're going to be my man. And then he spent several years being tutored by Christ, the risen Christ. And so he was a minister in this church. Timothy was there. Tychicus was there. John, as I said, was there. In addition to all this fantastic leadership, Paul had already written a letter to them 40 years earlier. So, so what we have now as the Word of God, which has been recognized by the church as the word of God itself, they had a specific letter written to them addressing their issues from someone who knew. This was indeed a church with a very rich spiritual heritage. It's a church that had superior leadership, a church which had, well, in this case, now two letters written to it. That's the church. Now the city. Ephesus was a self-governing city. What that means is that there was no uh, Roman legion located in the city. They were allowed to be self-governing. The population was between a quarter and a half million people. Big city, right? It was a principal city in this um, uh, region in, uh, of Asia Minor that is shaded in this darker color on this fuzzy map. It was a major trade center. So it had no Roman troops stationed there. Uh, it was one of the most important uh, cities in Asia Minor. It was called the Light of Asia. And there were a series uh, that happened periodically. I don't know if it was every year, but it was at least periodically. They had a set of athletic games that rivaled uh, what has now come to be the Olympic Games. It was a major trade center. It was a primary harbor and seaport accessing um, the entire region. And it was located at the end of a major river. The major river came down and flowed out uh, through or by Ephesus uh, into the Aegean Sea. Also on, on top of that, four major roads went through Ephesus, north, south, east, west, northeast, south, and west. Ephesus then also was the center of worship for Diana or Artemis. It was the location of the temple of Diana. 
This, this was a stunning place. It was 425 feet long. It was 260 feet wide, almost the width of a football field, wide at the front. So you're seeing the front here. It had 130 60-foot tall columns made of glittering Persian marble. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. About 30 of these columns were embellished with gold and with jewels. The temple itself contained a major bank. It was a financial center of the entire region. It had a museum. It was a sanctuary for criminals. And connected with the temple worship of Diana or Artemis, there went, it was accompanied with a huge industry of the production of and the selling of, of idols. Uh, you, you could have an idol that you'd hang around your neck. You could have an idol that you'd put on the front of your car- chariot. You could have uh, all sorts of places to have images of Di- Diana. And when you see her, you're going to ask, why would you want that? Uh, she is gross. But we'll, but we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, there was a major trade guild that was associated with making various idols and selling them. In fact, Paul got in trouble with that guild because when so many people became um, uh, believers, then they ran him up, said, you're causing a stir. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, As I said, Diana was not an attractive god, a goddess. Um, she, She is described in Acts 19, 35, Described as grotesque, squat. Well, I mean, all these details aren't there, but, but um, the fact that, that her image was supposed to have fallen from heaven, that's in Acts 19.35. That's what the people in Ephesus believed. But uh, that thing that fell from heaven was, was uh, grotesque and squat and black. Uh, she was a many-breasted figure that had been reputed to have fallen from heaven, uh, as it says in Acts 19.35. In the temple, this is Diana. This is Diana. And, and many, many of the images, and there, there, are, there are images from that time, they're not flattering. This is, this is not a pleasant God. Well, not attractive. There were eunuchs who occupied the temple and worked in the temple. There were priestesses which were just simply prostitutes. And to engage in worship in Diana, you can tell it's a male-dominated society, then you could go to the temple and you could engage in worship to to Diana by um, having sex with one of the prostitutes. You can see why it was quite popular among the men. Paul in Acts 19, as I said a moment ago, was run out of town because the, those who ran the idol trade were threatened because so many people were becoming Christians that they said they, their complaint was this man has upset with his, with his uh, fairy tales. They've, he's upset many of our people and it's upsetting our trade. And they took him into the, the theater. The theater there, it still exists today, holds 25,000 people. It's an awesome, amp- just great big amphitheater, and they ran him in there. You can go see it today. Go see it. Go see it if you want. They ran him into that place, and then the town supervisor came, and they talked, and, and anyway. The city, the city was a moral mess. It was a pit with a messy centerpiece and huddled in the middle of all this pagan idolatry and immorality was a church. Let's consider what Jesus said 
of the church that was good. And instead of reading this, I'll just work through each of, I'll just work my way through what's, what's written here. The first words Jesus spoke to each of the seven churches is, I know. 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 Seven times he says in these two chapters that he knows. Jesus knows absolutely everything about us. He knows he has no need to be informed. He can see in the dark. He can see through the ceiling. He can see behind closed doors. He can see what's in your mind and in your thoughts and in your heart. He understands your motives. In fact, there's absolutely nothing hidden from him with whom we have to do. But all things are laid bare. All things are laid bare. All th- you have no secrets. You think you have secrets. You have no secrets. You think you have troubles and pains that no one knows and no one cares about? Jesus knows. He knows. Even if you can't bring yourself to tell somebody else, he knows. Psalm 147 5 says, Great is our Lord and abundant in strength. His understanding is really, really big. I mean, like 10 to the seventh. Is that what it says? No. His understanding is infinite. There is no limit to Jesus' knowledge and the understanding our great God has. Jesus, the sovereign Lord of the church, knows. He knows the good. I know your deeds. I know your toil. I know your perseverance. Deeds refers to labor to the point of exhaustion, toil, hard work. If we could just really understand, Jesus knows what we do. Jesus knows that you serve in obscurity. Jesus knows that no one has ever come up to you and said, bless you for the work that you do. Thank you so much. He knows that you are working yourself to the bone, maybe in your relationship with your spouse, maybe as a parent over children. He knows, he knows your deeds He knows your perseverance, that you endure, that you're patient, that you remain under the pressure. You don't squirt out. You don't squirt away. The Ephesians were folks who remained faithful. They hung on. They hung in there. And you can imagine in this metropolis where the whole tide of society was to worship Diana and to enjoy just the the deeds of the flesh and to enjoy whatever they wanted. Oh, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? He knew all that. He knew all that. And they needed perseverance. And they had it. And Jesus recognized it. He said also that you cannot uh, tolerate evil men. They were intolerant of sin. They had a holy standard. They were probably engaged in church discipline. They could not endure evil men. Not just evil, but evil men. They couldn't couldn't endure them. You know how we sometimes emphasize that uh, God uh, hates sin, but he loves the sinner? Well, that's true. God does hate sin, and God does love sinners. But that's not all the truth. Because look at what Psalm 5 says. Psalm 5, 5 says, The boastful shall not stand before your eyes, speaking of God. You hate all who do iniquity. God hates sin. And God hates sinners. He does. That might be breaking your brain just a little bit. Romans 9.13 says, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. 
Yet at the same time, God loves the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God can hate sin and hate sinners, and he can love the world and he can love sinners. At the same time, God's not like you and me. Don't try to limit God based on what fits into your brain or into my brain or how we would think it would be like right or fair. No, God is above us. And I, for one, want a God who's bigger than me. God is different than us. He is capable of doing the things that he has revealed in his word that he does. Even if it doesn't fit in our way of thinking or we struggle over it. Now, I have to tell you, there are lots of things in the Word of God and, and in your Christian life that you're going to come face to face with that, that you don't understand, that it doesn't fit in to your head. It just, how can this be? That there is a challenge here, and that challenge is to say, okay, God, you be God. I don't understand this, but here's what I do understand, and obey that, and follow that. And over time, I guarantee you, God will grant you some understanding of various questions that you might have had when you started or that come up along the way. And 40 years after Paul, a generation later, full generation, they still had a hatred of evil and of evil men. That's quite... Stunning. He goes on to say, and you put to the test. You put to the test. They obviously had the right tests because they rejected the false. They tested doctrine, they tested character, and they rejected false apostles and false teachers. Great church. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake. This is Jesus telling them these things. They were in it for the long haul. They were marathoners, not sprinters. It's 40 years later. And they're still going strong in this way. They endured the toiling labor, the constant assault on sound doctrine, the overwhelming barrage of moral immorality in the community and from within the church. Why do this? Why? Why stand against the tide? For my name's sake. You've done this for my name's sake. Do we do it to please others? No. Do we do it to look good at church? No. Jesus said to them, you did it for me. And beloved, this is about our faith. Faith is seeing the the things that are unseen, right? Right? Can you see with your eyes of faith that God is paying attention to your life in every detail? He knows every struggle. He knows when you're weary. He knows when you long for someone to pat you on the shoulder and say, good job. He, understand, he knows that. He understands all of those things. We do it for him. We have an audience of one. Here's the right motive for long-term, toiling, decades-long service to God and to his people. We do it for him. And you have not grown weary, he said. Amazing. Galatians 6, 9, and 10 say, Let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we shall reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have the opportunity, let us do good to all men, but especially to those who are of the household of the faith. (laughs) What can make you weary in God's service? Is anything... You ever get weary in God's service? 
<laughs> yeah, right. Disappointment. You thought it was going to go well and it didn't go well. Ingratitude. No one, no one says thank you. Criticism. Rebellion. Lack of response. All of those things can make you weary. In spite of all that, they were faithful to the word, to the work, and to the Lord, to testing false teachers, to moral purity. They were faithful. And all of this with the right motive. They did it for Jesus' sake. This was a great church. <laughs> it's a great church. But wait, there's more. In verse 6, he adds something good. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus also hates. Now, who are the Nicolaitans and what were their deeds? This is the matter of some discussion because it's not absolutely clear. We have a clue in Revelation chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, in the letter to Pergamum, Jesus said, But I have a few things against you, speaking to Pergamum now, because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who, keep teaching, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. So you also have some who in the same way, as those other people, hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Well, we get a clue here that whoever the Nicolaitans were, some say they were early Gnostics, and there are some, some thoughts that are given uh, in the literature, but, but whoever they were, they were people who, who, uh, who uh, propagated the idea of eating things sacrificed to idols and committing acts of immorality. That at least describes some action of theirs. And Balaam uh, uh, was, uh, by false teaching, led the people into destructive sin. The, the name Balaam means destroyer of people, and Nicholas and, is uh, Nike and La, Laos, Laos uh, which is a combination of conquering people. So some say these names are similar, conqueror of the people, Nicolaitans, conqueror of the people, and destroyer of the people. I don't know if that actually plays in uh, to the whole thing, but um, in the same way, uh, so did those who held the Nicolaitan teachers, teachings. They were destructive in the community. They taught people to do immorality. They taught people to eat things sacrificed to idols. And we just saw the idol to which things were sacrificed. The Nicolaitans held to false doctrines that led people into destructive sin. That much we know. And Jesus said, you hate, their, you hate the deeds of these people, which I also hate. I hate it. So with all these commendations, <laughs> could, could, could anything be amiss in this faithful, doctrinally pure, morally pure church? I mean, it's an awesome church. Jesus said, but I have this against you, that you've left your first love. What? Sounds a little small compared to all these other things. It's not small. It's not small. And if Jesus has something against you, you better listen. Loving God, loving God is the centerpiece in a saving relationship with him. Matthew 10, 37 and 38 says, he who loves father or mother more than me, it's a matter of degree, scale, is not worthy of me. And he who loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. In John 8, 
42, Jesus said to the people to whom he was speaking, if God were your father, you would love me. If, if you were a genuine believer in God, you would love me. 1 Corinthians 16, 22, if anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. Now, while loving God in some measure is required to be a Christian, it's also true that the intensity of our Christian love varies over time. Every Christian loves the Lord to some degree, but not every Christian loves the Lord with all their heart, all their soul, and all their strength. That's what he wants. Deuteronomy 6, 5 says, But you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. I, I, think, I, might have, I think I might have understood this as a teenager. I was saved at 13. I was brought up in a Christian home. There was no major change in my life. It was just kind of in my head. Uh, I mean, I knew I was a sinner. I knew I was going to hell. If I died that day, I would go to hell. And I said, Jesus, save me. And, I know, and I, that's, how, that's how I became a believer. Uh, but in my teenage years, I mean, I, I was a good kid already. I was a good kid at school. I was the kid who was always the good kid. And people didn't like me because I was the good kid. And so, so there wasn't a lot of effect in my life. And as, as time went by... I became aware that you need to love the Lord, but I didn't like to say the word love because that's a big word. I didn't tell my wife I loved her until we were engaged. I, in other, well, let me put it this way. I didn't want to tell her I loved her until I was ready to marry her. It was, it was a big thing for me, very big thing to me. And to come to the point where I said, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, was not an easy thing for me. But I know the difference in my life from before that and after that. When I finally came to a point where I could say, I love the Lord. Do you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Well, It's not that they didn't love the Lord at all. They did. But it was that their love no longer had the fervency or the depth or the meaning that it did when they were first saved. It was perfunctory. It was, uh, had become a habit. It was, well, let's just say they were fond of God. And let me just show you the significance of this. Let's just work through a little situation here. I've got, it's right up here on the board. Would you like it if your spouse said to you, I have no passion for you anymore, but I will live with you, sleep with you, go places with you. I'll bring home the paycheck or I'll prepare the meals or take care of your needs and the needs of the children. But as for love, well, I'm very fond of you. Right? It's not attractive. Would you go for that? I don't, I don't think so. Would that thrill you and satisfy you and cause your relationship to thrive? Of course not. So why would we expect God to be satisfied with us going through the motions but not loving him passionately? This goes to motive, doesn't it? God wants us to obey him because we love him. John 14, 21 says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I'll disclose myself to him. 
We can tell how important this is to God when we consider the required action. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen. They had all these good things. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming over there. Remember. Remember. Remembering is critical. Remembering is critical. Remember your first love. (laughs) I, I do remember this. When I, when I was 13 and Jack Drake was speaking in the Mennonite church in Carlsbad and he was quoting verses and I knew I was going to hell. And uh, it's a 13-year-old. God's working on And I said, okay, God, I yield. I want you, please save me from hell. And there was an awareness that over time, maybe not that moment, I'm not saying there was a, there was nothing I was just sitting in the front row. It was just right over there. Second row, just right in from the edge of the pew. I yield it. I, I give. I want you to be my Savior and my Lord. But um, n- nothing that, but over time I began, and my brother put it this way about, about how amazing it is that, that, we, that God loves us and that he paid for all of our sin. And that, as that awareness grew more in my mind, it was like, oh my goodness, this is awesome. This is an awesome God that would make a way for a little sinner like me to be right with him. Our God is an awesome God. And that is a place where it's correct to use the descriptor awesome. Our God is an awesome God. And that grew in my mind and I knew uh, and I became aware it took me several years to just be able to express it. I love you, Lord. I love you mainly because I didn't trust my own heart. And finally, I gave up. I said, I love you, Lord. So, do you remember your first love? I have that recollection. It's very fresh. I experience it every time we sing a song about the love for the Lord. That's why I love singing so much. That's why I'm pushing you people to sing. 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 Oh, I don't like the song. Sing a new song. I got scriptures for all this. I, I don't like the way they use those. In- well, then get something else. Get, a, get symbols. Get resounding symbols. And if you go through the gauntlet, we might let you use them up here. But don't just bring them and use them, okay? But, but the, the uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> remember your first love. That's what one of the things our songs can do for us. Uh, we remember the Lord in the breaking of the bread. That's why we do it every week. We want to be reminded. We need to remember we can be reminded of what God has done in our lives when we see someone baptized. I know there's some stirrings now of a few people who want to be baptized over here and over there. And, and before long, we'll have a baptismal uh, cert, uh, time um, and, and we'll baptize some people. Uh, but that, let that be a reminder of, of your commitment to the Lord. Remember, number one, he said to them, remember. Number two, he said to them, repent. To repent... Um, is to turn around and go the other way. You're going this way and then you turn around and go that way. That's what repentance means. And to wane in your love for Jesus Christ is a sin. It's not just something that's not attractive. It's a sin. It's not just a Christian foible. It is something to be repented of. I repent, Lord. Now, can you unilaterally repent? Of sin? Well, you're part of it. But Acts 11.18 says, God granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. God grants repentance. 2 Timothy 2.25 says, If perhaps God may re- grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. So if you want to repent of, of a lack of love for the Lord, then you ask him, Lord, grant to me the repentance that I need, and then get on about your business of repenting, of turning around and going the other way. It's hard to turn around and go the other way inside your heart, though, and your soul, isn't it? Okay. We need to ask God to grant us true repentance. And then he said, okay, what is it? Remember, repent, repeat. 
do now what you did then. Your passion for Bible study, for fellowship, for prayer, for witnessing. Being unashamed to identify with Christ. Do it again. Do the actions and the emotions will follow. Now note how serious this is. Note how serious this is. Therefore, remember, repeat, repent, and repeat, do the deeds, or else I am coming to you, and I will snuff out your light unless you repent. It's like Jesus is saying, don't make me come over there. She's <laughs> like, Say that to the kid. Don't make me come over there. Because if I come over there, something's going to happen. And you're not going to like it. Don't make me come over there. (laughs) Then we have the exhortation. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This exhortation, this command, extends the application beyond just that historical church to the perennial church throughout the ages. What the Spirit says to an individual historic church, he also says to the churches. See that? What the Spirit says to the churches. It's plural. So it's not just for Ephesus. It's for the churches. All the churches. At all times, all around the world, in all places. So the exhortation extends beyond the church as a group to each of us as individuals. You love me like I want. If you are a believer, if you have spiritual ears, as Matt described a little bit in the first hour about being able to hear and see that what's true, that's a, that's a God thing. He does that in our hearts. He opens our eyes and lets us see. If you are a believer, if you have spiritual ears, then listen up. Pay attention. Take this to heart. If you have lost your first love, recognize it. Remember. Repent. And repeat the deeds you did at first, or else. Then he closes with a promise to overcomers. I love this. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. First, who are the overcomers? Well, (laughs) that's got to be some super saints, don't you think? That's got to be a special class of disciples. Well, let's let John explain who the overcomers are. In 1 John chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, he says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Overcomers are simply true believers, Christians. Every Christian, by definition, is an overcomer. Every true Christian, not every professing Christian, but every true Christian is an overcomer. I think that's awesome. And what will overcomers be granted in the sovereign, uh, by the sovereign Lord of the church? <laughs> this is so cool. I used to, as a youngster, be upset at Adam and Eve You guys, like, screwed it up for the whole bunch of us. And they did. 
They did, to be fair, they did. God put him out of the garden, posted an angel there. With a sword. You're not getting by. Angel doesn't need a sword against a man. But this, they had swords. In other words, access to the tree of life was blocked. In other words, in their fallen state, God did not want them to eat of a fruit that would give them eternal existence in that fallen state. He didn't want that. So it was blocked. And I'm uh, upset uh, uh, just a bit about it. (laughs) What's up with that? But, but, if I'm an overcomer, I will be granted access to the tree of life. That tree. That very tree. The first tree was in the, at first the tree of life was in the garden of Eden. And now the last tree of life will be in heaven. I mean, this is just, this is just very, very awesome. The, the, this is the promise of um, uh, going to and participating in the joys of heaven. Every true believer will be granted heaven. And you can take that to the bank. Every true believer. I, I, I just think of the sadness. Let's just say, of, let's say the Jehovah's Witness uh, sect. They, they, they have the thought that um, only 144,000 people will actually go to heaven. The rest of those who are, live morally good lives, essentially, will be able to live, out, live on earth. But only the 144,000 can actually go to heaven. So Jeff Cedar says, when he is confronted by a Jehovah's Witness, he just says, hey, are you one of the 144,000? And no one will ever say they are because they don't know and they don't think they actually can be. So they'll say, hmm, 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 no. I don't think so. I wish I was. So Jeff's question then is, well, if you don't know that you're going to heaven, how can you teach me so that I can go to heaven? You don't have something I need. But beloved, every true believer is going to be in heaven and every true believer has access to the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. Wow. (laughs) Isn't Isn't this awesome? This is good stuff and there's six more to go. There's six more to go. Well, Let's pray. Lord, I ask that you would stir in our hearts, that your word would be powerful and active and work in our hearts, and we would acknowledge and see where we fall short of what you call the Ephesian church to do, that is to love you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. We need that inspection. We open ourselves up to you. At least I do, Lord. I don't know about these people, but, may, but probably, I hope they do. Open themselves up to you and say, evaluate me, Lord, and let me see where I have fallen from my first love. And help us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we have time for some questions. So, Je- oh, well, yeah, I don't have to tell Jeff to turn on the mic. Did you turn on the mic? Okay. So, so the question is, and if you want me to do the research for myself, I'll do it. I'm going to ask it. Okay. What does it mean to have you to remove your lampstand from the church or from ourselves? Well, I, th- I think the lampstand is not about, in Revelation chapter 1 and 2, is not about ourselves. That's about the church. And to remove the lamp, the tr- Look, every one of these churches' lampstand has been removed. They are gone. There is no church in Ephesus. Pergamum, Smyrna. So, so over time, what it means is that in a church, if there is no spiritual life there, if there's nothing that that resonates with God and says, I, I want to keep them going, he will take it. And what that means is he'll, he'll, he'll snuff them out as being a church. 
Now, that doesn't mean the human institution will go away. There are lots of quote-unquote churches today that don't have any Christians in them. We're going to see some in this list of seven that are just way down to just like a few. So the answer to your question, to remove the lampstand is to, is to end the church, that, church, that specific body. And possibly physically, in, in this case, they're, they're, they're just, I mean, uh, in the, I'm not sure what the century was, but the, the people who live in Turkey today are not the people groups who lived there at the time. The Turks came in, they took over this whole region, and uh, it became a Muslim place. And uh, um, there, there are a few, there are just a few. In some of these cities, there are just like, the number of Christians that are there can be counted on one hand that, that other people know about. They've been snuffed out. Okay. If you have, a, if you have another question. Thanks, Jeff, for being brave and standing up. And, Anyone else? Come on. Okay. We're dismissed.